the basic question of what is quantum mechanics is, you know, kind of a question about like, you know, what is the, what are the strangest things that you think are possible and why is that actually happening, you know, at small scales? It's, it's basically a question of like, let's change our, our perceptible reality to include things, you know, for example, like I can be standing here and standing here at the same time, or I can walk this direction and disappear, reappear on the other side of that wall. Um, or if I want to shine a, a laser beam, I can slow that laser beam down to the point that it's no longer a beam, but it's a sputtering of little packets of beamlets, if you will. So we're, we're going to the point where when you, when you look on very, very small scales, look at very, very low energies and very, very short time periods, we start to see weird shit happen, basically. And this, this is a kind of a listing of what some of that weird shit is. I, I apologize for the language, but that's kind of really how there's no other way to describe the, the oddity of the quantum universe. So number one, and, and these are going to feel like they're, they're not going to be that groundbreaking re revolutionarily, um, revolutionary, but um, the, the consequences of each one of these bullet points is going to be like immense. So number one, uh, we learned that um, occasionally, particles, for example, electrons, um, act like waves, or particles are spread out like waves are. So they're no longer that little dot, that little point that we view them as non-quantumly. Uh, uh, non particles are spread out or wavelength. So that's a weird thing that we're going to delve way deeper into exactly why that is and what the, the direct observable you know, effects of that is. The second thing, we learn, that, we learn that not only are particles, which are usually thought of as like small billiard balls, not only are they spread out and you know, travel essentially as waves through the universe, not like billiard balls through it. Not only that, but light, which we always thought did travel as waves, and did have a spread out wave-like nature is in fact, fundamentally particles. And we call those particles, as you've probably heard, photons. So in, in essence, particles behave a little bit like light. Light behaves a little bit like particles. Light also behaves a little like light. Particles also behave a little like particles. So basically we're blurring the lines between you know, what we thought of as, um, you know, basically the, 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 the dichotomy of mathematics, the continuous mathematics, the, the, the mathematics of functions versus discrete mathematics, mathematics of, for example, integers or bulleted lists, things that are divisible or, or quantized. And by the way, that's where, where the word quantum comes from. Quantized means, or, or quantum, a, a quanta, a quantized thing means that you can item it one, two, three, four, that those numbers or bullet points are indivisible. That basically it, it's packets or discrete parts you can clump together all as a unit. And we see that light, which we always thought were beams of light, are individually quantized into energy packets. And particles, which we always thought were in fact quantized, are not really. They're actually kind of spread out and behave a bit as waves. Now, number three. Not, not only does that weird view of how like the universe fundamentally works start to get blurred, but now we have to consider, okay, what happens at really small energies? So if you can somehow measure like the vacuum of space, and that, that's a whole other story, but if you can measure the, the tiniest amounts of energy, we always assume that, that you can basically turn up the dial, that you can like begin with no energy and just add little tiny bits in as small, you know, minimal increments as you'd like. That's not true. The universe has a minimum amount of meaningful energy that it can exchange. It's kind of like, you know, you can't pay someone less than a cent if you have like physical change in your pocket. You know, you can either give someone a cent or two cents or zero cents, but, you know, unlike a credit card transaction, so that doesn't work, the universe doesn't have credit cards. Um, but unlike that, um, the universe does have a smallest energy packet that below that you can't exchange energy. And that's another strange thing. 
So there's a minimum amount of energy that is at least like physically meaningful. You know, you, you can, I can tell you what that number is and you can tell me a smaller number, you know, divided by 10, divided by 100, but that's no longer physically measurable or physically significant. So what I'm talking about here is the smallest amount of energy that would actually make a meaningful difference in an outcome. Um, because, by the way, everything about quantum physics comes back to the observable outcomes. And that's why it becomes so weird, because some of these observable outcomes are different than those that are predicted by classical or Newtonian physics, and, and even by relativity. So um, when you have different observable outcomes, they may not be, you know, like on a scale or, or, or a continuous range. You might have two very different observable outcomes, which are quantized. And that's really how, how quantum physics works, and that's where the name comes from. You can quantize you can quantize energies. You can quantize, it turns out, space. There are, there's the smallest, the Planck length of space, 10 to the minus 34, 10 to the minus 34 meters, I think. Uh, I, I, no, 27, something like that. Um, meters, like it's a tiny, tiny amount, but no amount of space smaller than that is going to be physically meaningful or, or predictably different than anything on that, that lower than that. Um, turns out, same thing with time. There's a, the, the smallest possible unit of time that, but beyond that, um, you can't talk meaningfully about that. And that's really interesting because that means that when we try to apply our laws of physics backwards in time, based on the, the motions of galaxies that we see today, we can trace those backwards so that galaxies at, in very earlier times tended to almost be upon us. And if we go back far enough, all of the galaxies in the universe, this is Hubble's law, all of the galaxies in the universe seem to converge to almost precisely the same point in space, which is us, from our perspective, or, or it will be the same from any other perspective. But the point is that as we can trace the laws of physics back further and further in time, and we can predict what the universe would have looked like 100 million years after the Big Bang, what it would look like, you know, 10,000 years after the Big Bang, and, and we actually do know all of these, you know, pretty, you know, remarkably well, um, or at least we have every reason to think that we're correct in our, our understanding. Um, we weren't there around there to, you know, see it. We can even predict what the universe looked like all the way back to about a second, three minutes after the Big Bang, things like that. And one of my professors in, in undergrad at MIT was um, the one who discovered what's called inflation. Um, and that's a prediction about how the universe worked at the time of t uh, 10 to the minus 27 seconds after the Big Bang initiated. Or in other words, the universe began expanding and there was a period of, of, of not just normal linear expansion, which is what we're doing now, like galaxies are coasting, that's what happened to, to start. Um, but there's a very brief period of, ex of exponential expansion where it inflated to the size it is today. So check out the inflationary theory of the universe. So the whole reason why I'm talking about the universe in a, in a mention of quantum physics is that we, uh, Alan Guth is his name, by the way, the, the inflationary theory by Alan Guth, G-U-T-H. Um, but he used the laws of quantum physics to predict what the universe would look like at 10 to the minus 27 seconds after the universe began. But that brings up a really good point because there is a sm smallest meaningful time in the universe too. And we know, we know that to be about, well, a tiny fraction before Guth's prediction became, you know, um, describing the universe. And so there's an a earliest time at the beginning of the universe that makes sense. And that's kind of a crazy thing to think about. Like, you know, we always thought, like, you can go back, you know, just divide that uh, time by 10, divide that time by 10, uh, by 10, and so on. Um, no, actually, there is a earliest instant of, of actually meaningful, you know, description of the universe after it began expanding. We, we literally don't know anything about that instant of expansion, and that's one hole in our quantum physics theory. So just to tell you that there is more of the story that we haven't discovered yet, that's kind of where it breaks down. Um, so the last thing I'll add about this, with that kind of, you know, bizarre thing in mind, uh, these, are, these are basically the three most important predictions that we're going to see. Um, and the fourth is basically that, you know, in addition to those three things, uh, which we can we can actually mathematically analyze, which is what we're going to do in the in the latter half of this course. Um, <clears throat> the last thing here is that even you even if you can predict things, you can't because the universe itself is in fact random. That and and this is like strangely enough, it's proven. There there's what's called Bell's inequalities, 
And there, there was a set of, of a couple different competing theories. Einstein, um, this is called the EPR paradox, Einstein, uh, Podolsky, and Rosen. Um, Einstein set forth a, a view that he understood that the implications of quantum physics meant that you shouldn't be able to make predictions about the future, like at least uh, definitively. There's always going to be a, a seeming randomness in the universe. It was, it was Einstein's more or less his personal view that the, it, it's that the, we, the reason why we can't make predictions about the universe isn't because um, the universe is random. It's just that we don't have all the information available to us. And so Einstein's view is that there's more information than, than is accessible to us. That there's basically hidden information in the universe. And that, that will explain away some of the random behavior of the universe. Turns out that is factually incorrect, that all of the experiments that were done in the, in the 20th century show that, in fact, there is, no, there is no way to hide information in the universe, that the universe is inherently random, that you cannot make definite predictions about what the universe will, will look like from instant to instant, at least on, on small scales. That the best you can do is describe a probability of something happening, and then we just let God roll the dice, which was Einstein's way of kind of, you know, like he was a bit jeering at that theory. Like he didn't like the idea of there being like, you know, God being a poker player is kind of how he summed it up. Um, but that is seemingly how the universe works. It is at its heart random, which is hard to digest. That there is at its fundamental scale, you can't make a positive prediction. And that, that really kind of still plays with my, my mind. And when I say random, I mean statistically random. That there's you can you can statistically predict the, the likelihood of outcomes, but given a single outcome, you can't definitively know what of those possible outcomes it will it will be given a, a set of you know possibilities. You do it enough though, the law of averages, which the universe also very weirdly understands. Um, that's another weird question, but that seems to work out. So all of these things are basically like, it, it's, it's so weird how the mathematics works out. Oh, and by the way, all this, not only does quantum physics say this, but then it like, it mathematically proves it to be true. And, and that's just the kicker for all this. So um, that is what I would consider to be quantum physics, which it, it's just kind of an intro to like, you know, how we're going to delve into this further and how some of the math mathematics are going to be, you know, like, okay, mathematically, it says that, why can that actually be true? And honestly, we're not going to have an answer. We don't understand why the universe is like that. We simply just understand that the universe behaves like this. And that's the best we can do. But as it turns out, every theory that we have made based on quantum physics, um, which, by the way, when we include Einstein's theory of relativity, when we kind of meld, uh, at least special relativity, when we meld those together, we get what's called quantum field theory. That's one step higher. Um, we can then include the theory of electromagnetism, at, in, it, um, we quantize the, the electron and, and the, the quark, we now understand. So when we combine not only quantum physics and relativity, but also then we, we combine um, uh, those, the, the, it, everything meshes together to be an even higher level description of the universe called quantum electrodynamics. And that ends up being the single most accurate uh, theory that mankind has ever devised. We understand predictions, or we can make predictions to about eight or nine decimal points, which is more, you know, significant figures than any other testable theory out there. So it is amazingly correct, but we still don't inherently understand why it works. We just understand that it does. So that's an intro to what we're going to see here. I'm going to pause. I get excited talking about this, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs>